If you have your Bible, would you please turn with me to John chapter 12. Today, of course, is Palm Sunday. It's the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. It's also called the triumphal entry. It's just a few days before Jesus would be put to death and a week before his resurrection. Palm Sunday, what Jesus does during this day, sets things in motion to bring about his own crucifixion. But today, what I want us to see is that God had an important plan that was being fulfilled even when the disciples didn't understand. And I want to share from John's side of the story today. This is one of the unique incidences in the life of Jesus that appears in all four of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John but each with their own unique perspectives. I wanna look at John's perspective today in John chapter 12. You can follow along beginning in verse 12. It says, the next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King, of Israel. When Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, he sat on it. As it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And here's where I want to focus our story today in verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Today, I want us to look at in this Palm Sunday story that between the promise of God and the fulfillment of that promise, the performance of that promise, There's always a period of time. But in that period of time, God is preparing you for something and that something for you. But in that period of time, it's hard to wait. And so I wanna share a message with you that I'm entitling The Waiting Room. And let's pray and ask God to bless this time that we have to be together. Lord, as we come before you and open up your word, We pray once again that your word would take root within our lives. Transform and change us by your word today. And that we thank you that your word is alive and that through your word, you can speak to each of us individually where we are at in our lives. And so God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see you clearly from the pages of your word and that you would speak to each of us today as if this message was for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We live in a fast-paced society where we want everything to happen immediately. We want all to happen real fast. That's why we even have fast food. We want our food fast. And I love how when you go through the drive through window at some places, they have those little timers with a little note that says, if your food isn't out in 60 seconds, your fast food is free. And I love that because right when it gets about 45 seconds, I start getting excited. Like I might get a free meal, but they always come out before the timer is up but we can't even wait 60 seconds to get our food because we need everything to happen fast. We have fast food, we want fast cars. How many people do you know have ever picked a car out because of how slow it goes? Like, uh, that only has five horsepower, it's great. I never have to worry about going over the speed limit. No matter what, it doesn't go that fast. We have fast food, we want fast cars. We even have microwavable meals called instant dinners. 
We want our dinners to be instant. Why? Because cooking, in the words of the lady who went viral, ain't nobody got time for that. We have fast food, we want fast cars, we have instant dinners, and they even have express lanes at the grocery stores. Interesting enough, they also have them on the highways. How many of you have ever used the express lane at the grocery store? With a show of hands, you've used the express lane at the grocery store. I love that lane. That is the lane I want to be in. And I, whenever I go to the grocery store, even if I'm set to get more than 10 items, because they're limited to 10 items or less, I limit myself to 10 items because I want to get in and out fast. And how many of you with a show of hands have ever been guilty of counting anybody else's items in the express lane? I always find myself doing that, you know, one, two, three, 12, 12. For sure, they have like 26 in their car. What do they do? Attention shoppers, this person right here should not be in the express lane. We have fast food, we want fast cars, we want fast dinners, we even have the express lanes because in this fast-paced society, we have lost our ability to wait. None of us like to wait. None of us like to have to be patient. I've heard someone say, make sure you never pray for patience because God might test you with that one. None of us like to wait. That's why we even get angry when we hit a red light. Come on, somebody, you hit a red light. And what's worse is when you, the light turns yellow and you're just a little bit too far to gun it through. You know, yellow means slow down, but in California, it actually means go really fast because we live in a fast-paced society. And when you hit the red light, you know, it's not even like you came up to a red light, but you hit a red light, it turned red in front of you, which is the worst because you know you're gonna have to wait there the longest. It's gonna be at least an extra 10 seconds. And heaven forbid you have to wait an extra 10 seconds. Now the worst thing is when you get stuck behind a red light that doesn't have a sensor. Anybody ever get stuck behind a red light that doesn't have a sensor and there's no cars on the road? No one's there. Minute after minute goes by, hour after hour, at least it seems that way. And you're waiting. How many of you with a show of hands have ever been tempted just to go through the red light when no other cars are on the, man, there's so many bad drivers at Calvary Chapel Chino Valley. We don't like to wait. And so it should be no surprise to us that when it comes to the promises of God being fulfilled in our lives, that we have a hard time waiting to see what God will do. But what I want us to see today is that when we go through a difficult situation, when we're in a season of difficulty, what I want us to see is it's hard to see what God is doing when you're going through difficulty. But even when you don't see what God is doing, just because you don't see it, doesn't mean that God isn't in it. We walk by faith, not by sight. And so I want us to see today the importance of us even when we don't understand what God is doing, we're not always called to understand God's plan, but we are called to simply obey his command. So when we go through circumstances that we don't understand, whether it's a tragedy that takes place, whether it's a car that breaks down, or perhaps it's a relationship that didn't work out, or the boss who said, I no longer need you, and the boss lets you go, or your plan of going to that college that you didn't get accepted to, whatever it might be in your life, when we don't understand why, we ask God, why are you allowing this to happen? And sometimes we don't hear an answer. We don't understand why. And you're in that period of time that I call 
the waiting room. You're waiting for the great physician to come through. You're waiting for God to do what he promised he said he would do. But sometimes day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year goes by, and it seems like God isn't coming through. But even when your plans look like they are failing, God's plans are still being fulfilled. We don't like to be in the waiting room. Even the word waiting room comes with a sense of dread. Why? Because it has the word wait in it. And we don't like to wait. In the waiting room, well, just to prove that point, three letters that can cause all of you to dread the waiting room. D-M-V. None of us like to go there. Why? Because we know we're going to have to wait until they call G-1,426,390. And then it's your turn. Not only the DMV, but the doctor's office. No one likes to spend time in the waiting room in the doctor's office. I, I have three young children and going to the pediatric office, it's not fun because, well, I try not to let my kids touch anything because everything is gross. You know, every doctor's office for children seems to always have play food. Why? Because what every child wants to do with play food is pretend like they're eating it. And you know they never clean that stuff. And so no one likes to be in the waiting room for any extra time. No one likes to be at the DMV because we have to wait. But when you are waiting, God is still working. When you are waiting, God is still working. Write this down, number one. When you are in the waiting room, God is working. When you are in the waiting room, God is working. Romans 8, 28 says that God is working all things together for good. For those who love him and are called according to his purposes. God is using this waiting room, the season that you're in in your life presently, whether you're in home, literally waiting to be able to come out of your home, or you're in church in a difficult season, you're waiting for things to change. No matter what waiting room you're in, when you're in that waiting room, God is still working. Working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And that's why when our plans look like they are failing, God's plans are still being fulfilled. And that's what I want us to see in this Palm Sunday text today from John chapter 12. This is what makes Palm Sunday so special, is that when we realize what Jesus was doing was always all a part of his plan, even when his disciples didn't understand. It says in verse 12, the next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna. Hosanna literally means save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. It's interesting, this Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, and Jesus came in on a donkey and people were laying down palm branches. Palm branches in the Bible is a sign of royalty. And they were laying their cloaks down, we know, from another passage of scripture. And when they were laying their cloaks down, it was an act of homage to royalty. Palm branches and the laying of cloaks, what they were doing is they were having a triumphant entry. You see, when a king would go off to battle and he would be victorious, 
he would come back from that battle and in the capital, they would have a parade of sorts where people would come out and celebrate their great king who has led them to victory. And so when Jesus was writing in what the people were doing, they were recognizing him as king. That they were acknowledging and accepting Jesus Christ as the king of their lives. Because they thought Jesus was coming to overthrow the Roman rule and to free them from that yoke of oppression. But Jesus came to do something far greater than to free them from Rome. Jesus was coming to free them from their sin. And so they were shouting Hosanna, which means save now, save us now. I like how Hosanna means save now. Even back then they lived in a fast paced society. It wasn't like save us when it's your timing. No, save us now. Now is the time, God, for you to answer our prayers. We've been praying and praying and praying for someone to deliver us out from the Roman rule of oppression. So you're the man, you're gonna do it now. But it's interesting that when Jesus came for a different mission and Jesus didn't do what they wanted him to do, this same crowd that was shouting, save now, Hosanna, on Sunday was the same crowd a few days later on Friday shouting, crucify him. And I wonder if we, like this crowd, can be fickle. When God doesn't do what we think he should do, when we think he should do it, we go from, God, you're my king, praise you, God, love you, God. And then when we don't see God come through in the way we think he should, when we think he should, we say, forget that, death to my faith, crucify it all. I don't need that because God didn't do what I thought he should do. Listen, there's one thing certain in life, one thing. Actually, two things. Two things are certain in life. There is a God and you're not it. And if you think that your plan is better than what God has for you, then you're completely misunderstood. Because God's plan for you will always be better than what you could ever plan for yourself. So when your plan doesn't work out like you think it should, you need to understand just because your plan isn't working out doesn't mean that God's plan isn't working out. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter three that his ways are not our ways, his ways are beyond finding out. And then it, it says this, that what God would do in our lives is greater, beyond, above, exceedingly, anything we could ever think or imagine. God's plans are better than anything that you could ever plan for yourself. So when God's plans are being fulfilled, listen, if you knew what God knew, you would only want what God has planned for your life. And so these people were shouting Hosanna, King. But they were the same people that were saying, forget it, when God didn't do what they thought he should do. But what Jesus was doing was always a part of his plan, although it wasn't what the people had planned. Matter of fact, this wasn't something that Jesus decided to do the day before. Like, I'm just gonna get on a donkey. This was actually prophesied about 500 years before this moment in time. It was prophesied how Jesus would come. Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding on a donkey. Actually, I'll be even more specific, a colt of a donkey. 500 years earlier to this, God said how Jesus would come. 
riding on a colt of a donkey. But not only how Jesus would come, but to the exact day when Jesus would come. In Daniel chapter 9, prophetically, Daniel predicted the very day that Jesus would ride in to Jerusalem. When the commandment comes for the Jews to rebuild the temple, there will be 69 sevens. 69 sevens just means 69 times seven. That's 483 years until the Messiah enters Jerusalem. Daniel predicted exactly when the Messiah would come. You look at history, when King Artaxerxes in March 14th, 445 BC, gave the decree that the Jewish people could return to their homeland from Babylon and rebuild the temple. From that day, March 14th, 445 BC, if you go forward 483 years to the day, which using the Babylonian calendar or the Jewish calendar, both 360 day a year calendars, you go forward 173,880 days. If you go from March 14th, 445 BC, forward 173,880 days, that brings you to April 9th, AD 32. The exact day first century historians recorded that Jesus rode in on a donkey into Jerusalem. And then you begin to realize there is no whims with God, but everything God has planned out. How Jesus would come, when Jesus would come. Listen, and that's something to be so grateful for because when it comes to your life, there are no last minute plans with God. God's not trying to figure out like, what should I do with you now? Like, I don't know, like I don't really have anything going on for your future. So I gotta figure something out. Like I was really surprised actually you gave your life to Jesus last year. So um, I really, you know, counted you out. So uh, I don't know. That's not God. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, a very well-known quoted verse that God has a plan for you. But it's not our responsibility to know God's plan, but simply to obey God's command and following him. And then you'll see God's plan worked out as you follow him day by day. God has known you before the foundation of the earth. And when God knew you, God had a plan for you. But even when it's all a part of God's plan, sometimes we don't understand God's plan. So we're in that waiting room. And that's what it says in verse 16. We see the disciples in the waiting room. It says his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. We see in our text that Jesus had a plan all along, that Jesus knew that when he rode into Jerusalem, this would set things in motion to bring about his crucifixion and ultimately his resurrection, his plan to redeem humanity and to be the savior of the world. It was always all a part of the plan. But the disciples didn't understand. They didn't realize what was happening and to their perspective is probably kind of weird. Because usually kings would ride in in their triumphant entry on a white stallion. And they thought Jesus would ride in like that, but now he's on like a baby donkey. And they're like, that's kind of weird. Like, people are snickering, and the Romans over there are like, oh, that's their king? Our king rides on a white stallion, and he's on a little donkey. And they didn't understand what Jesus was doing. It says they didn't understand these things at first. And when you go through circumstances where you don't understand why this is happening, when you don't understand why this tragedy took place or this difficult situation or the trials that we face and you don't understand why, God, why would you allow this to happen? What you need to do in the waiting room 
is number two, write this down. When you are in the waiting room, you should be worshiping. When you're in that period of time, when you don't understand why, we need to worship and praise God because what God has for you is what you would want for you if you only knew the outcome. Verse 16, it says, but when Jesus was glorified, then they realized that it was all a part of the plan. Sometimes you never understand God's plan until you bring Jesus into your own situation. And you can rack your head trying to figure it all out, but when you look to Jesus, you realize it was all working out all along. Even when I didn't see it, God was working. Psalms 12, or excuse me, Psalms 121, verses one through two says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. When you start glorifying God, when you take your eyes off of your problems and you lift your eyes and you put your eyes on God, where we're told in the Bible to fix our eyes, to focus on not the problems around us, but our Savior and Lord who loves us. When I lift up my eyes to the hills, he says, I realize where my help comes from. The psalmist declares, even when I don't know what God is doing, even when I don't know why this is happening, even no matter the difficult problem or situation I might be in, no matter what you have lost, like the disciples, when you glorify God in your life, when God is glorified through you, it's then we begin to understand what God was doing all along. Now, it's important for us to understand that when we complain, all we're doing is talking bad about God. If we find ourselves grumbling and we truly believe that God is in control and he's working all things together, all we're doing is talking bad about God and his plan. Because God promises to work it all out for good. And like the disciples, they didn't understand. But when Jesus was glorified, listen, people are watching your life. They know you're a part of Calvary Chapel of the Chino Valley. They know you believe in the Bible. They know you go to church on Wednesday nights. Like once isn't enough for you? Man, you're a radical Christian. Because you have a desire to study God's word, because you want to know him more. So you say, you know what? I'm not gonna just be a, a once a week attender to church. I wanna be in Bible study. So I'm gonna come on Wednesday nights to study God's word because I'm a double dipping Christian. And I want more. Like when you have ranch with carrots, you just need more. And so I just wanna be in Bible study, and not only Wednesday night Bible study, but I'm gonna get connected into a small group in this study, in this group, because I wanna grow more. And people look at your life and think, you're crazy. But then when they see you go through difficulty, and it doesn't affect you like it normally would, like that naturally would cause someone to worry or panic, when the entire department is being cut from the company, and everyone's in a panic, but you have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You don't know what's going to happen in your future, but you know the one who holds the future. And so people see your life and they realize there's something different about you. Why aren't you worried? Why aren't you complaining? And you say, because I know God is in control and he's working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. It's then God will be glorified in your life. God gets the glory because you aren't doing what you normally would do. It must be something that God is doing. And the unbelieving world sees a difference in your life. And when they do, God gets the glory. You're no longer cussing like you used to. You, you don't go to those places. You, you're not drinking anymore. You're not doing those things because, 
Well, you're different. You're set apart from the world. And if you do everything that the world does, people can't see a difference in your life. But when you're set apart from the world and people see there's a difference in your life, it's then they know that can't be you because they remember who you used to be before you knew Jesus. You go to church. How many times have you ran into an old friend and you found out they believe in Jesus too? No way, not them. There's not a chance God could save them. And then you find out he did it for them too. And the funny thing is they're thinking the same thing about you. And then God is glorified because if God could use you, use me, a kid who was, parents were told that would never be able to speak properly. God would use me, a person who was told, parents were told that would never be able to speak because of the high palate in my mouth and my tongue wouldn't be able to reach and he would always have a speech impediment. And God would choose me to be a spokesperson of his word to his family. And God would choose you to do things that wouldn't normally ever be possible for you to do either. Guess what happens? God gets the glory. And God ought to be glorified in our lives by the way that we live. And when God is, then you start to understand, okay, God, now I understand why you took me through this. Now I understand why it's, it's after. It says in verse 16, one more time, his disciples did not understand these things at first. And sometimes when you're going through things at first, we don't understand. But when Jesus is glorified, then they start, started to understand and remember the things that were written about him. It was then they saw the plan of God being fulfilled after the fact, not before. I was just talking with a friend this past week who I had been praying for for over five years for a job, a different job. Thankfully, he was employed, but this job would cause him to travel and work 23-hour shifts all night. It was keeping him from serving in ministry like he desired to do. And he wanted just to have a, a normal hourly job where he could be there for his children on the weekends to be at baseball games. And his work was taking him away from his church family. It was taken away from his family. And he, and he wanted to have something different, but he also knew he needed to provide. And he knocked on doors continuously. And for five years, nothing. I got lunch with him this past week. And he said, hey, do you remember how we've been praying for that? I said, yeah, for about five years now, right? He said, listen, God opened up a door for me to get into a job where now I have normal hours and I'm free to be able to serve the Lord and be there with my family. But for five years, that's not even the greatest part of the story. Just hold on. For five years, when he had that job, because he was in that job, making what he was making, he, he ended up losing his condo that he was renting and had to move. In the middle of that waiting room, he said, if the Lord would have just opened up another job, I could have stayed here. I wouldn't be losing my home, the place to live. I don't know where we're going to go. But shortly after, God moved him and opened a door for not only a condo, but a house for them to rent. And then he told me that because they moved to that house to rent, which is better, now the new job, he's actually making more. The person that owns the home that's been renting to them for the past couple of years said that they want to sell the home and are now going to sell it to us for tens of thousands of dollars under market value. And so now we're going to be able to buy a home that we never thought we would ever be able to do. And I said, don't you realize that if God would have answered your prayer when you wanted him to answer your prayer and bring you to that new job, you would have never lost your condo, you would have never moved, never had to move, and you've never received what God wanted to do for you and your family. And then we realized, because God didn't answer his prayers and my prayers and our prayers when we wanted him to, God was able to do something far greater than we ever thought he would do. And that's what God can do. 
And so when things aren't working out like you think they should, when you think they should, listen, because we live in that culture of the fast-paced society, we want everything now and we want God to do it now. Listen, when you are waiting, God is working. And because you know that God is working on all to good, when you are waiting, you ought to be worshiping. And simply praise God because you know he's got it all worked out. I wonder if we can praise God before he comes through and fulfills his promises like we do after he comes through and fulfills his promises. You're not sure how you're gonna make the bills and you're worried and panicked and then God comes through in some way, puts it on someone's heart to bless you or you get some type of rebate you weren't expecting and now you're able to and you're like, oh God, praise you, thank you, God. And you worship. I wonder if God thinks, why didn't you worship me like that before you saw me come through? The check was already on the way. The provision was already coming. But just because you didn't see it caused you to stop believing in what I promised I would do? Church, I wonder if we can worship before we see God come through like we do when we see God come through because we walk by faith, not by sight. And it's when God is glorified in our lives, it's then things start to make sense. You might be in your waiting room right now, but when you worship in the waiting room, you begin to see God working out his plans. Isaiah 14, 27 says, the Lord of heaven's armies has spoken. Who can change his plans? When his hand is raised, who can stop him? In other words, nothing can stop the plans that God has for you. Job 42 verse 4 says, I know that you can do anything and nothing that you plan is impossible. God always has a plan and the plan that he has, he is going to fulfill that purpose from that plan. And even when you don't see it, it doesn't mean that God isn't in it. I want to close with this story because my wife Morgan and I found this to be true. We had to go to the doctor's office and when we were at the doctor's office, when we were leaving and loading up the kids into the car and getting them into their car seats to leave the doctors, there was a mom walking by towards the doctors with her about nine or 10 year old son. Right when that young boy walked right past me, he took one step and I saw out of the corner of his eye, he passed out, went out cold completely and fell face down into the cement. He cracked two of his teeth, blood started pouring out of his mouth. The mom obviously by herself with her son went into some kind of a panic, not understanding what's happening to her son. And my wife Morgan and I were right there, the kids were in their car seats, so we began to attend to them. I picked up his feet and began to elevate his feet, handed those to Morgan and I ran to get help from the hospital that was next to the doctor's offices. When I came back from that area, Morgan had the mom holding the feet and Morgan was holding his head up. Still the boy, after all that time, was still unconscious. And Morgan had her hand on his forehead and she was just praying over him, praying healing upon him, protection for him. Eventually, what seemed like an eternity, the boy finally came to, and at that moment, the hospital workers came and put him on a gurney and took him away quickly, and the wife said, please, can you text my, or call my husband and tell him we're here, tell him what happened, here's his number, can you please, and I walked with her as they were taking her son to dial the husband to call him to tell him what happened, and so I called him and said, hey, your son just passed out, um, your wife, he's been rushed into the hospital, um, she wanted to let you know. Her phone was, was dead, so she couldn't call herself, and so she asked me to call you. And so he came, and, and so they were taken care of, and we went home. And when we got home later that evening, Morgan and I were talking, and she said, I haven't been able to get that young boy off my heart all day. I said, you know what? I haven't either. And we were talking, I wonder if he's okay. I wonder what ended up happening. You know, I hope he's okay. And I said, you know what? I have the dad's number because... The mom's phone was dead, and so I called the dad. I could just text him, and I was thinking, well, maybe that will be weird. You know, some guy, some man, how's your little boy doing? I'm like, 
don't want to do that. And so I said, you know what? I'll just tell him I'm a pastor. And so I said, hey, this is Pastor Brennan. And my wife and I have been praying for your son and for your family. And he's been heavy on our hearts all day. And we just wanted to check in to see if he was okay. We were the ones that were helping your wife attend to him when he passed out. And we just wanted to make sure he was okay and if you guys need anything. And he texted me back and he, he said, he's okay, he's great. The biggest problem is that he's embarrassed that his front tooth is knocked out. So we're going to the dentist first thing tomorrow morning. And uh, I said, okay. I said, here's what you need to know. We got on the phone. I said, I need to tell you this. What you need to know is we shouldn't have been there in that moment. What he didn't know and what you don't know was earlier that morning, my son Shaden had an earache that continued to get worse and worse and worse. And you know, we tried a few home remedy things to make it better and, and tell him to suck it up. No, not really, but you know, the best home remedy. And uh, we, we tried some things at home to alleviate the pain, but he started crying because of the pain of his ear and it wouldn't subside. And so he began to ask to go to the doctors. And if you know anything about my son, Shaden, he hates the doctors. He never wants to go to the doctors. And now he's asking to go to the doctors. So we knew it was serious. And so we finally took him to the doctors. And when we got to the doctor's office, it was weird. There wasn't one parking space available in this giant parking lot. I drove to the farthest corner and there wasn't one parking space. And it's not like you're at the mall at Christmas when there's, there's cars leaving and then cars pulling in, you're just not getting one. There was no one leaving. It was the weirdest thing. For about 20 minutes, I was just waiting outside the doctor's office, waiting for someone to leave to follow them to their car. And there was no one leaving in this moment. And so finally, Morgan said, well, we're running late. I got to get into the doctor's. Just drop me off. And I went to drop her off. She said, actually, go around to the other side. There's a little turnabout. It's a little bit closer. Drop me off over there. So I, I went over there and I'm like, oh, I don't really want to go over there because that's the valet area. And the valet probably doesn't want me to pull in there, but I pulled in there and the valet guy told me to roll down my window and I'm thinking, see, I told you I shouldn't come over here. And he says, hey, just, there's no parking right now. Just leave your car right up here up front. Just, just leave it. You guys can all go in. So I helped with the younger two while Morgan took Shaden in and we went into the doctor's office. While we were in the doctor's office, Shaden was attended to and got on some medication for his ear infection. And then she said, well, let me take a look at the other two which doctors don't normally do because you have to have appointments because that's how they get paid. And if you don't have an appointment, they don't get paid. And, but she, pro bono, started looking at our other two kids and taking time with them. I'm thinking, this is amazing. And at the moment that we got out of the doctor's office after the doctor took time to walk to our car that was parked in the valet area where you normally wouldn't be able to leave your car, and in the very moment we were putting our kids into the car was the very moment that that mom walked by with her son and he passed out. And I told that father that story. I said, listen, we weren't supposed to be there that, that day. We were only there because my son got an ear infection and we couldn't get one parking space. So I went to drop them off and we went to a different area and the valet guy and the exact time that we were in the waiting room, which I was complaining about because we were in the waiting room for a long time that day. And no one likes to be in the waiting room. Reminds me of a message I heard. And so after all that time, it was the exact moment, the exact time we walked out. So I said, listen, God was watching out for your son. And he said, that's so crazy. And he goes, you want to know even the crazy part? He said, yesterday, we got a flyer to a church called Regenerate Church with some guy named Pastor Brennan. And we had no idea that was you that was attending to our son. But when you sent me the text saying, hey, this is Pastor Brennan, we put two and two together. And we realized that our son passed out because God wanted to get a hold of our lives. Now, when you're in the waiting room, why does my son have to have an ear infection? And why does he have to be, why do we have to go to the doctors again? I mean, he was just sick and can't he just be better? And God, why? God, why? God, why? And then you realize if you just follow God and what God's calling you to do, he will always be glorified.
Listen, when our plans look like they are failing, God's plans are still being fulfilled. When we are waiting and wondering, we can know that God is still working, so we should just be people who are worshiping. God, you know what's best, and I'm gonna follow after you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, that you fulfill your plan. And even when we don't understand what you're doing, we can understand that you still are accomplishing your plan. And so, Lord, today, I pray for each of us that might be in a period of time like a waiting room, a time of uncertainty or a time of difficulty. God, I pray for each of us that we would know and trust in you that your plan is being worked out, the perfect plan in your perfect timing. And so, God, if it's not working out in our timing, maybe there's some here today that thought they would be married by now, or some here today thought they would be in a different career path by now, or some here today thought they would be in a home by now, or some here today thought this or this or that. Lord, but today we understand that you have us where you have us because you're preparing that for us and you're preparing us for that. So help us to be those that just glorify you while we are in the waiting room. In Jesus' name.